right, welcome to the Principles, Principles of Biology live stream. Uh, I am Hunter, and this is Animal Evolution. Uh, we'll be looking mostly at invertebrates today, but these are really important sort of touchstone phyla uh, in helping us understand how animal evolution progressed towards increasing complexity in life that we see today. So to start off, uh, we have this chart with the key invertebrate phyla. We have periphera and adaria, polythelminth, platet, platet, <laughs> platyhelminthes, um, among others. And then sort of key characteristics on the left, I guess the y-axis of this, this chart here. And we're going to work our way through these um, kind of highlight the important bits here and see what patterns emerge. So starting at the top, we have example organisms for periphera. We have sponges, nidaria, we have hydra, corals, and jellyfish. I'm going to do my best to keep these in the grid, but we'll see how it goes. Please. All right. Next, next up for platyhelminths, we have, broadly speaking, these are all flatworms. There we go. We've got planaria, flukes, and tapeworms are the sort of example organisms here. Nematoda, these are our roundworms, broadly speaking. Nematodes, nematoda. We have Ascaris, we have horsehair worms. Annelida. These are our segmented worms. Probably most like the garden worms that y'all are familiar with. These are earthworms, leeches, and fanworms. All right, mollusca. All the really tasty ones. Assuming you're not allergic to shellfish clams, oysters, and snails. Arthropoda, insects, crabs, lobsters, crayfish. And Echina dermata. Starfish, sea cucumbers. We've got sea urchins and sand dollars. So from jellyfish, which have really amorphous shape, to flatworms, to roundworms, to segmented worms, to mollusks, to arthropods, to echinoderms. So we have a number of tissue layers in embryos. So periphery and sponges, this doesn't really apply. There is no real, really embryonic sort of tissue differentiation here. Um, Nidaria, we have the two, the ectoderm, ecto being external, and endo being inside, so you have two embryonic tissue layers. Platyhelminthes, there are three. Ectoderm, mesoderm, meso, middle, endoderm. So the mesoderm allows for the evolution of the circulatory system to arrive, or, or to, gi gives, excuse me, <sighs> mesoderm gives rise to the structures that allow for more complex circulatory systems and true muscles. Uh, 
All right. So I'm just going to do a big... Um, how do I want to do this? I think I can draw it. Yeah. So I'm just going to draw a line here to show that everything to the right of that is also true. So everything from Pelihelmint, Platyhelminthes up through Echinodermata all have that three embryonic layer, uh, tissue layers. All right, so now we have tissue versus organ level development. In periphera, those sponges, we have a quasi-tissue level. It's not a true tissue as, as we would recognize it. Um, and we have, uh, in Nidaria, we have tissue level, true tissues. Um, Platyhelminths, we have tissue level with the beginnings, with the beginnings of organs in the reproductive system. Whoa, there we go. And then by the time we get to nematoda, we have true organ development. All right, true muscle cells. No true muscle cells in periphera, no true, mu well, no true muscle cells in Nidaria, um, though we do have that epithelio uh, muscular cells, epithelium being the, mm, the top of the thelium, the top of the, uh, uh, when we think of epithelial cells, we're thinking about like the um, inner lining of the intestine and things like that, is how we would recognize that in um, mammals like ourselves, but. I think the, um, excuse me, the lens of the eye is also a type of epithelial tissue. Anyway, I digress. We have true muscle cells. Yes. <laughs> By the time we get to platyhelminths, nematoda, yes, and... Let's see. We have longitudinally arranged muscles only. Once we get up to Annelida, those segmented worms, we have longitudinally longitudinal and circular muscles. And then increasing complexity. Now symmetry. Symmetry is really important from a developmental uh, perspective. It also enables different kinds of movement and organization within the organism. Um, when we get up to, well, I'll let us get up to echinoderms, but in sponges we have no real symmetry. Um, no cephalopathy, so, um, excuse me, <laughs> cephalopathy. <laughs> Cephalization, um, cephala, head, asian, uh, formation of the head. No cephalization, head formation, that's what that means. And these have a sessile lifestyle. Sessile meaning drifting, um, no real self-directed movement in that life cycle. Boy, that's going to bug me. Oh, well. <laughs> Once we get to Nidaria, so jellyfish, we have radial symmetry. No cephalization. And also a sessile lifestyle. 
So mostly drifting, very little kind of self-directed uh, mobility, um, though they do have some. Um, radial symmetry being kind of, you'll have a front and a back basically, but the sides are all more or less identical. Platy helminths, we have the emergence of bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry you will recognize because that's what we as humans have. With concomitant appearance of cephalization and locomotion. So with the arrival of bilateral symmetry in the sort of evolutionary history of animals, we have the <laughs> concomitant or, or simultaneous, basically, appearance of heads and self-directed motion. Now, which gave rise to which is, I guess, something that you could debate. So echinoderms, the reason that I kind of brought a point up there, you'll see starfish in here. And starfish, if you remember, they have five or more arms um, and eyes and sensory tissue at the ends of all of those arms. And it was previously thought that starfish had radial symmetry. But if you have the opportunity to dissect a starfish uh, in one of your labs, I would encourage you to, you can actually find um, symmetrical uh, bilateral symmetry in the internal structures of the starfish, which is kind of cool. So this also kind of highlights the difficulty <laughs> in categorizing some of these because there are exceptions. There's convergent evolution where organisms will diverge and start to look more like uh, ancestral species or um, two species will branch off, create their own sort of lineages and then have emergent property, emergent characteristics that resemble each other even though they have completely separate evolutionary paths. So now we're into Porifera. Come on now. So what is a coelom? I'm gonna get you an actual definition. So you can categorize a lot of critters by uh, whether they have a true coelom, a true cav, a true body cavity. Um, located between uh, what would be the intestinal canal and the body wall. So in periphera, again, we're talking about our sponges. There we go. There's no coelom, none. Same through nidaria and platyhelminths. And then once we arrive at nematoda, so nematodes again being roundworms, then we have a pseudo coelom. So not a true coelom, but it's a gut not lined with mesoderm embryonically. So it resembles a coelom, it resembles a body cavity, but it's not a true body cavity yet. yet. It's not a true coelom. Once we get into Annelida, that's again our segmented worms, we have what's called a schizo coelom, formed by splitting of the mesoderm embryonically. These are structures that are much easier to understand graphically, so if you can look up some images of these I would encourage you to. I know there are some good ones in the textbook. So we have that schizocelum up through arthropoda. 
And then once we get to echinoderms, we have what's called an entero coelom, an internal coelom, formed by outpocketing of the gut. So this trend is going to follow pretty closely with whether or not we have a digestive tract, so uh, or a digestive tract as we might recognize it. So we have intracellular digestion in those sponges. Once we get to Nadaria, we have a gastrovascular cavity. So. gastrovascular cavity and some extracellular digestion and also some intracellular. So intracellular is contained within the cell, metabolism contained within the cell, and extracellular would of course be digestion occurring outside of individual cells. Platyhelminths, we have that gastrovascular cavity. Uh, that's more highly branched. So more branches, more increased surface area for digestion to occur across cell membranes, is my assumption. And then we get into nematoda. So now we have a one-way digestive tract. And this is going to be complete from mouth to anus. And this allows for more energy input per unit time and evolutionary allow evolutionarily this allows for uh, increased specialization along the tract. So it allows for more energy input per unit time and evolutionarily allows for specialization along the tract. Uh, yeah. Increasing specialization as we get up through the other phyla. All right, circulatory system. Same deal. With sponges, with really small organisms, all of the um, circulation, the nutrients coming into the organism, waste products going out is happening primarily through diffusion, uh, just passive movement of um, molecules across a cell membrane. In Nidaria, we've got diffusion and some facilitation. Facilitation of circulation. Via fluid movement in the gastrovascular cavity. Similar story with platyhelminths. We have diffusion. Some facilitation. Facilitation. Circulation via fluid movement. In a hydrostatic skeleton. Nematoda. Mm, that actually belongs here. So, sorry, the hydrostatic skeleton belongs under Nematoda, and in platyhelminths we have 
diffusion, there's some facilitation. There's circulation via fluid movement in the gastrovascular cavity. Analita, we have the first closed circulatory system. mollusks, some species have an open circulatory system, again we were talking about the difficulty in categorizing some of these because it's rarely so simple, some species have an open circula circulatory system and some have a closed circulatory system. squid and octopus. Uh, once we get to arthropoda, all species have an open circulatory system. Again, kind of moving backwards, it seems like, in terms of complexity. And then a kind of dermata we have We're back to a closed circulatory system, as we would expect in terms of that increasing complexity of the organisms. Complexity. You got to be really careful using sort of wobble words like that because it can mean different things based on uh, who you're talking to and what you're talking about. Um, a closed circulatory system is certainly more specialized. Obviously, it's not the most optimal solution for all organisms, even as we get into more recent evolutionary history. All right, nervous systems. Super fun. Um, back to sponges. None. All sensory information is processed through B-cell communication. Communication. <laughs> Nidaria have what's called a nerve net, so some specialization of nervous tissue. Platyhelminths have a ladder like nervous system uh, with ganglion and the head end. Nematoda have lateral nerve cords. Oh, what's going on? Analita have increased complexity of that lateral nerve cord, and that increased complexity continues on up through the rest of the chart. Other is kind of an opportunity for you to think of your own categories uh, that might be an indication of this sort of progress in evolution or history in evolution. All right, so moving on to the next part here. Using the information in the chart and in chapters 30 and 31 of Biological Science 7th edition, answer the following questions. What set of characteristics is shared by all of the invertebrate animal phyla in the charts? So all of the phyla that we covered are invertebrates. What set of characteristics is shared by all of them? Th 
think back to when we were categorizing um, the most broad um, domains of life. Bacteria, archaea. Right? We, we talked about the number of cells in the organism, single cellular versus multicellular, and whether it was making its own food or not, autotrophic or heterotrophic. So all are multicellular, multicellular heterotrophs. Multicellular, made up of more than one cell, heterotrophs, hetero, other, trophs, energy or, or consumption. I'm actually not sure what trophy. Nourishment. Troph is a, is a combining form used like a prefix meaning nourishment. So hetero meaning other and troph meaning nourishment. So getting nourishment from other organisms or other sources. Cool. I learned something today. What unique combination of characteristics defines each of the invertebrate phyla as separate from the other phyla? So if you just read down each column, you can determine the characteristics of each phylum. So no single characteristic defines each phylum. We kind of talked about that as it was seemingly moving back and forth, but rather it's the specific combination of characteristics that is unique to and defines each phylum. So there's, n let's see, no single defining characteristic of each phylum, unique combination defines each phylum. So it's no single characteristic, it's all of them sort of holistically. If you compare the characteristics of one phylum of, in, of the invertebrates with the next, what key differences separate the groups from each other? So to answer this question, you need to really compare the characteristics in a given column or phylum um, with those in the next. Those characteristics that change from one column to the next represent the key differences that separate the group. So for example, let's look at annelids. Um, annelids differ from nematodes. Annelids differ from nematodes in that annelids have both longitudinal and circular muscles and a uh, schizocelum, whereas nematodes have only longitudinal muscles and a pseudocelum. So in all other respects, at least those listed in the chart, the two, the two phyla are very, very similar. So... In that annelids have both longitudinal and circular muscles and a schizocelum. Whereas nematodes have only longitudinal muscles and a pseudocelum. So pick a couple of these look at the defining characteristics between them, between columns, um, and make those comparisons. This will really help you start to uh, not memorize per se, but understand the key differences between them. And failing that, at least be able to recognize trends as you get towards more recent um, evolutionary organisms. All right, so looking across the rows, what major trends appeared? The important thing here is recognizing the trends, not necessarily memorizing. So looking across the rows, what major trends appear to occur in the evolution of various organs or organ systems in these animal groups? This chart is set up to allow you to visualize how the various systems changed in the evolution of the various files. The arrangement also allows you to visualize major trends in this evolution. For example, if you look at the number of body layers in the embryo, you can see a change from no apparent differentiation of body layers uh, in, in the development of sponges, for example, to the appearance of two distinct body layers in the embryos of Nadaria, uh, and then ultimately the appearance of uh, three body layers in the embryos of uh, Platyhelminths and all subsequent animal phyla. So the chart is arranged. The chart is arranged 
to help visualize trends uh, in evolution of various phyla. How systems changed. Uh, example from Um, if, if you look at the evolution of the phyla in this way, you, you really don't need to memorize all of the characteristics of each phylum. Um, in, instead, you can really, you, you just need to remember only where major changes were introduced. Um, so, for example, the platyhelminths have all three body layers, and so does every phylum following platyhelminths. Um, the mesoderm layer allowed for the evolution of the circulatory system and true muscles. Platyhelminths have true muscle cells, and all the phyla following platyhelminths do as well. Um, however, the types of muscles may vary. So recognize that as a super important sort of transitional uh, feature, and then, then you don't have to memorize as much. All right. Does this analysis provide evidence for or against the statement evolution adds onto or modifies what already exists. We've kind of already talked about this when we were talking about the um, endosymbiont theory. Um, one feature led to the next, which allowed for the emergence of the next most complex organism or the or the next grouping of organisms so as is apparent in the chart these modifications are built upon what already exists so So using an example from the chart, for example, we can see an evolution from no clear separation of body layers in the sponge embryo to two body layers in Adaria, and then three layers in body helminths. And the addition of the third layer, the mesoderm, allows for the evolution of muscle cells and the elaboration of the muscle, cell, muscle system uh, through succeeding phyla. All right. The chart organizes the major groups of animals based on grade, or shared body plan features. What changes would you need to make in this organization to reflect the possible phylogenetic relationships uncovered using molecular evidence? All right, let's break this down a little bit. Chart organizes the major groups of animals based on grade or shared body plan features. Um, What changes would you need to make in this organization to reflect the possible phylogenetic relationships? So phylogenetic is going to be much more specific to the DNA makeup of each of these organisms, um, and that analysis might reveal uh, different, different evolutionary histories than we can see by body plan alone. So recent DNA analyses indicate that among the bilateria, bilateria, oh, I can't, bilateral <laughs> organisms with bilateral symmetry. Um, among the bilateria, the nematodes and arthropods should be grouped together as the ectisozoa. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and write this. Recent DNA analysis indicates that among, uh, you don't have this information in the chart. This is from outside sources, and so this is just a, a good example. Um, among the bilateria, um, animals with bilateral 
symmetry or body plans. Nematodes and arthropods. Arthro. Should be grouped together as the ectozoa. Um, this is one of those little factoids that unfortunately would be good to have memorized. I seem to remember this being uh, an exam question and it was in the form of um, an alternative uh, evolutionary tree or a, yeah, evolutionary tree diagram. Ectozoa. Uh, the echinoderms and chordates, chordates having a true like nerve cord, um, should be listed among the deuterostomia and the remaining phyla among the uh, lophotrochozoa. Um, a couple important figures in your textbook for this. Absolutely take a look at those. Know what they look like. Um, if I remember right, those will be on the exam. Or they were on mine. Alright, so numerous developmental characteristics are used to determine evolutionary relationships among animal phyla. What developmental evidence was used to link annelids, arthropods, and mollusks evolutionarily? So developmentally, annelids, arthropods, and mollusks are all protostomes. All are protostomes. Uh, they all display spiral determinate cleavage. So protostomes has to do with uh, which opening of the organism mouth or anus forms first during embryonic development, if I remember uh, correctly. Uh, so proto would be early and we're going to look this up. Protostomes, meaning multicellular organism whose mouth develops from a primary embryonic opening, such as an annelid mollusk or arthropod. There you go. So all our protostomes all have... What question am I on? Spiral determinate cleavage. Um, in the development of the digestive tract, the blastopore becomes the mouth. And the coelom forms developmentally as a split in the mesoderm. Coelom forms as a split in the mesoderm. What evidence is used to separate these phyla from the echinoderms and chordates? So echinoderms and chordates are deuterostomes. Deutero Stones. This means that developmentally they undergo radial indeterminate cleavage. Indeterminate cleavage. Um, in the development of the digestive tract, the mouth forms from a secondary opening opposite the blastopore. All right. Mouth forms from secondary opening opposite the blastopore. Um, that is, this is where the, the term deuterostome comes from. The mouth forms secondary um, from the secondary opening opposite the blastopore, which forms first. Blastopore and 6b. The coelom forms from Mesodermal outpocketing off the primary gut or arc enteron. The 
archenteron is the rudimentary alimentary, so feeding cavity, of an embryo at the gastrula stage. All right, in biological terms, question seven. A group of organisms are said to be successful. Successful is an awfully wobbly word. A group of organisms are said to be successful if represented by a large number of species or if the mass of all the organisms in the group is large. So in both cases, large is determined relative to other groups or organisms. Given this definition of success, which of the major groups of animals would you argue is the most successful? And be sure to provide evidence for your argument. Um, there, this, is, this is one of those really fantastic, like there's no one right answer. It just depends on the criteria that you've chosen and how you want to how you want to argue for it. So for example, did you choose success based on total mass of organisms, the total number of organisms, or the total numbers of different species of organisms within a group? So on one hand, because nematodes are found as uh, ectoparasites and endoparasites in almost every living organism, they could be considered the most successful. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the total number of known species, you might argue that arthropods uh, are the most successful. Any reasonable argument is acceptable here. You just write something, as long as it is backed up with some evidence that indicates why the chosen group uh, should be considered the most successful. That's all I've got you for you today. Um, have some fun with this last one. Really, really chew on it for a little bit. Um, I'm going to let you reclaim that time. If you are joining us from the future, I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed. Um, as always, don't forget to turn in those worksheets for extra credit. Good faith effort gets full credit, and we'll see you next week.